Hi, and welcome to this lesson on the polymerase chain reaction. So our aim today is to outline how this thing, polymerase chain reaction, can be used to make multiple copies of DNA fragments. So the first two things I'd like you to do is, first of all, add the definition for polymerase chain reaction from page 223 of your textbook. And also, uh, I'd like you to look at this sequence down in the bottom left-hand corner and see if you can continue that sequence for one, two, three, four, five, six more um, six more va uh, values of that sequence and tell me what type of sequence that is. Okay, so pause this video and come back when you've done those things. Okay, so first of all, the definition. So polymerase chain reaction, a biomedical technology in molecular biology that can amplify a short length of DNA to thousands of millions of copies or billions of copies. Um, and then the sequence should have continued like this. And that's a geometric series and it's showing exponential growth. That's something which we uh, should be quite familiar with at the moment. Uh, and the numbers quickly become very large. So here's a kind of follow on question for you from that, if you, especially if you like maths. If you were to repeat that sequence to its 30th number, so two to the 30, what would you then have? What is two to the 30? See if you can do that in your calculator real quick and come back to me. Well, it's a massive number. Uh, Oh, I think I've typed that wrong, haven't I? So that is, is it 10 billion? 10 billion. So 10 billion uh, copies. So the reason I wanted to get you thinking about this doubling and doubling and doubling again is because that's what polymerase chain reaction does. It takes just one piece of DNA and it copies it to two pieces. It copies those two pieces to four, to eight, and so on and so on. And if you run that copying cycle 30 times, you can go from one piece of DNA to up to 10 billion pieces of DNA. Uh, so that's why it's an extremely, extremely powerful tool and we'll look at some of the applications that it can be used in later on. But what about the process? Well, the process of the polymerase chain reaction, we're gonna sum up in this diagram here. So if one of my students, you should really print this uh, slide off um, and then we're gonna annotate around the slide and I'll send that out to you on Teams. So the first thing is that we start over here on the left with a double-stranded DNA sample. So that's this over here. This is the DNA that we want to copy. And in order to copy that, we have to get the two DNA strands to separate. So we actually heat it up to 95 degrees C and the strands separate. And in that process, the hydrogen bonds between the complementary base pairs, they, they break. So the two strands come apart. Now in cells, when we're copying DNA, we'd have things like helicase and gyrase to, to unwind and then unzip the DNA. But uh, in the PCR machine, we do this with heat. So it's a 95 degrees C, and now we've got two single-stranded pieces of DNA. Now, before we can actually copy these single strands, we need to add some primers. So these are short strands of nucleotides, um, and they bind to the DNA that we want to copy, uh, and we cool it down to about 55 degrees C to allow these primers to stick to those strands. We call that annealing. So we have hydrogen bonds forming between the primer and the DNA strand. So now the primers are attached to the, to the, to the sequences of DNA that we want to copy. And we purposely designed the primers so that uh, they attach to the sort of opposite ends of the strand, of the part of the DNA that we want to copy. So then once the primers are annealed, we raise the temperature again, we raise it up to 72 degrees C, and this is when a DNA polymerase enzyme binds and adds free nucleotides to the, um, to the single strand of DNA to form two now double-stranded pieces of DNA. So that would look a bit like this. So here's a, um, a little a GIF of a, a DNA polymerase enzyme. We can see it's adding those free nucleotides. It's making those um, phosphodiester bonds down the backbone. Remember the hydrogen bonds, the nucleotides, they just kind of float in and those hydrogen bonds form spontaneously uh, if the temperature is low enough, but the uh, polymerase enzyme is making the phosphodiester bonds as it goes. Okay, so that's the process in outline. Uh, and what I'd like you to do in a second is to make some more notes on that. But first I wanted to mention that this whole process uh, is an automated process when we do this in a lab and it happens in a machine called a thermocycler that looks a bit like this up here. Uh, and you sort of program in all the, the the kind of temperatures and the times that you want and it just runs round and round and round this sort of loop and typically it loops 30 times um, before your DNA is kind of copied or amplified to the level that you want. So 
I'd like you to watch this video now because I think it's a really good one to uh, kind of see this process happening. Uh, so I'll put this link in the description for the video below. So watch that and then come back to this video. What I'd like you to be thinking about specifically is how much of the DNA sample is actually copied and how do the primers that we use direct what sequences are copied when we do PCR. So watch that video and then come back to this one. Okay, so hopefully you watched that video now. Hopefully you found it useful. So I think these were two bits of the video that I quite liked here because it, it shows you that once you copy the DNA a few cycles in, you get more and more of the um, this type of DNA here, where the level, the part of the DNA that is copied is directly between those two primers. So you get this bit here and this bit here. And eventually after sort of cycle 25, um, copies of the target DNA, that is a lot, that's 33 million, I think, was it 30, yeah, 33 million, and the sort of variable length fragments, which are things like this, there's only 50 fragments. So, and that's really because the target DNA sequence is copying, uh, doubling and doubling and doubling again, so it's kind of a geometric progression, whereas the variable length fragments um, are only increasing in a kind of arithmetic progression. They're adding two and adding two as opposed to timesing two, timesing two. So a bit of maths for you there. All right, so now comes the part where you have to uh, just go with me here and do a little bit of oracy practice on your own. Can you describe this whole process using this little image here? So I've given you the image again. I've taken away the information which you sort of noted down and I'd like you to see if you can describe this process either back to me or to anyone around you, see if you can describe it. Try and use as many of these words in the blue box as you possibly can. And it's you kind of practicing saying this sort of stuff that you're really gonna remember it um, as well as you possibly can. So pause the video, have a go. Okay, did you give it a go? Did you get all the words in the blue box? Hopefully yes. Um, one more follow-up activity for you. So if you copy these axes in your book, how would the temperature change in a thermocycler over time? So don't worry too much about the timings, just each stage will be a minute or two. Um, but how would the temperature change if you repeated, let's say, two or three cycles? What would it look like? Okay, copy the axes, draw in what the temperature you think would look like, and I'll reveal it to you in a second. Pause the video. Okay, so this is an actual graph taken from the internet of a thermocycler temperature kind of cycle. So we go up to 95 to denature, down to 55 for the primer to anneal, uh, and then we go up to just about 70, 72, it depends on the cycler, for the DNA synthesis, uh, and then back again. Okay, so now's an opportunity to go to your textbook, just read over page 22, uh, 24, uh, and 223, and see if you can add any more detail to this process. Do, do you really understand? I'd like you to also make a short note on what is a primer, this part, and why is it needed? Uh, and also maybe you can go a little bit deeper into TAC polymerase. What is so special about it and where does it come from? And that's the bottom of page 223. Okay. So TAC polymerase, hopefully you've done those notes now. If you haven't, do it now. So TAC polymerase, here it is. Uh, that's the protein structure, and you can see we've got lots of alpha helices, uh, got a beta-pleated sheet there, that's the yellow. And this part here, this orange, is where the DNA is actually bound. So this is a TAC polymerase act actively um, replicating DNA as we speak. So it's a DNA polymerase enzyme, it's a naturally occurring DNA polymerase enzyme, and it was identified in a bacterium called Thermus aquaticus in 1976. And this is the type of place that Thermus aquaticus lives. This is uh, I think this is Grand Priasmatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. So it's really, really hot. The temperature's in, you know, in the 80s and 90s uh, sort of degrees centigrade there. So this bacteria is used to hot temperatures. So therefore its proteins are very thermo thermostable. And this protein is stable for over two hours at 90 degrees C, so that it won't denature for over two, two hours. It maintains its enzymatic activity. Um, if you heat it up to about 95, it, it's stable for less long. It will sort of degrade over about 40 minutes. So remember in, in the thermocycler, we go up to 95 degrees C, but we only have that there for a minute or two. And then we typically work at around 70 degrees C. So you buy this uh, enzyme in little kind of 
packets like this. So if you're a biomedical researcher, you, you, your TAC polymerase and comes in little vials like this that you can buy on the internet. Um, and TAC polymerase works really quickly. Uh, I wrote this down here because I can't remember, exactly, remember the exact numbers, but I think it works at about 100 base pairs per second at 72 degrees C. So adding 100 phosphodiester bonds in the chain at 72 degrees C, and it even goes up to 150 um, at 80 degrees C, which is its kind of optimum temperature, which is very high because remember most enzymes work at optimum about 37. This operates at optimum at 80 degrees C. So that's a bit about TAC polymerase, but what are the applications of this technology? Well, well really there's just thousands of applications of this technology, but these are the ones that the textbook mentions. I'm gonna go through each one of them very quickly. If you'd like to add more detail, you can go into your textbook and, and make some extra notes, but, he, but here they are. So do a little mind map perhaps in your book, take a, a page or half a page, and here we go. So first of all, tissue typing. So if you want a, um, uh, like a new kidney or a, a new you know, uh, pancreas or something, I don't know, any organ really, um, it has to match your tissue type. So when you're screening potential donors, tissue typing is, is, is the process. You need to look at their uh, genes and sort of sequence the, uh, the key genes that determine tissue type and PCR is involved in that process. Second of all, detecting oncogenes or, or, or even uh, sequencing tumors. So this is something that we're doing more and more, trying to kind of target uh, cancer medicine. We're looking at the individual mutations of a certain tumor uh, and trying to figure out what uh, cancer treatments will be the most effective for um, that specific tumor. So to look at the genes of a tumor, first we have to copy them and amplify the, the number of those genes and have enough DNA to work with, and then we can sequence and, and try and focus our therapies. We can also detect other mutations. So this is a, quite a novel technology. So um, we can look at mutations in, potentially in um, embryos. So uh, a, a more traditional technology is um, in IVF, uh, when the embryo is a very small stage, um, something like you know eight to 64 cells, we can take a cell from the embryo and sequence the, the genes in that one cell and then see if there are any mutations. But a new technology is uh, with um, in pregnancies that, that aren't necessarily IVF, in pregnancies that are already a few months uh, along, we can actually take a, a blood sample from a mother, a pregnant mother, and using some quite clever PCR, we can um, amplify specifically the, the, um, the fetal genes that are circulating at a very low level in uh, the mother's blood and we can actually kind of detect for mutations in uh, any fetus from just looking at the mother's blood uh, and that includes chromosomal mutations like trisomy 21 or down syndrome so that's really really interesting technology i'm not really sure how that works why don't you look it up it sounds pretty complicated to me but pretty interesting Here's another one, identi identifying viral and other infections. So actually the coronavirus test, there are two tests um, being used at the moment, and one of them is a PCR-based test. So what we do is we um, design primers that will specifically copy the DNA from the coronavirus, um, and if we, you know, if there is coronavirus DNA in, in a person's throat swab, for example, they kind of scratch the back of the throat, and if there is coronavirus DNA present there, it will be copied, and then it can be detected. The other type is an antibody test that we're working on. And if you'd like to go into more detail about that, I've, I'm going to attach this link at the bottom of the video, which is a Scientific American article about the two different types of tests and how they work for coronavirus. Monitoring the spread of infectious disease. OK, so this is obviously uh, at the moment we're in a, uh, a sort of pandemic uh, and it's come from this virus has come from, we think, either pangolins or bats. Uh, but we need to actually really be monitoring other viruses that are present in animal populations that might have the potential to jump over to humans. And that's something that is ongoing. Uh, it has been, you know, being done for many years and, and I imagine it will probably step it up and, and do even more of it in the future uh, after this uh, pandemic sort of takes its course to try and predict if there will be new viruses that might emerge and, you know, try and get ahead of the curve and, and have maybe vaccines for them even before they jump to humans. Forensic science uh, is probably an application of PCR that you might already be aware of. You can get DNA from a crime scene, but we're talking about tiny little fragments of blood or, or bodily fluids here, and then we can copy that gene, or copy the genes in those uh, tissue samples, 
billions and billions of times to then um, do, for example, DNA profiling on them, which we looked at last lesson, DNA profiling. Finally, research. So PCR is just a very uh, you know, key tool in biochemical research and biomedical research, and it's also used in, can be used in synthetic biology, for example, that we looked at um, last lesson again. So those are some of the applications of PCR, and really there's many, many more that we didn't look at. Um, and now we come to the, the final part of this lesson, which is just, do you kind of understand it? So here are some questions from your book, which I'd like you to um, work through. So work through these five questions, see if you can answer them as best you can. Once you've finished answering them, then you can um, come back to this video and I'll put the mark scheme just underneath and you can see how you've done. Okay, so pause it now, have a go. Here's the mark scheme. Uh, how did you do? Add any green pen corrections, make sure you've included co-words and things like that, like cofactors, for example, uh, and then send a photo of this together with your notes as well for me on Teams so I can see how, you, how your work went. Um, and finally, before you go, we always do a little syllabus check. So actually in the syllabus, is just this one sentence about PCR. Do you understand the principles of the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, and its application in DNA analysis? Okay, so that was today's lesson, PCR, and next lesson, I believe, is gel electrophoresis. So I'll see you then. Thanks. Bye-bye.